wasn't quite ready yet in um, Psalm 57, and that is correct. I am there. That's good. All right. <clears throat> um, Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> this has um, been said to be the most difficult chapter in the entire book of Revelation to, to preach on or to teach on or understand. I venture to say it might be the most difficult chapter in our Bible to have to actually teach on and preach on because it's not continuous in any way. The chapter 11 sort of looks back and looks forward then stays in the present time and doesn't really give you any indication when it's doing that. In other words, you're going you're gonna, to, all of a sudden, chapter 11, it's going to look forward to chapter 21 and 22. Then it's going to go back to chapter 6, reflecting on the same events. Then it's going to be present time. So, you, and it's, so it's very, very hard to follow. Whoa. Excuse me. Indigestion. <laughs> and um, it's very, very hard to follow. Do, do we have it? No? All right. All right. And um, so it doesn't advance the nar narrative. If we can get it at the end of service, let me know. But if we can't, that's great. At, of, the, of the previous chapters, and seems to point to the events that are realized, fully re realized later in the book. We will take a simple narrative and literal approach to um, interpreting this. Now, verse 1, Revelation chapter 11. Then I was given a measuring rod um, like, a, like a staff and was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, <coughs> excuse me, and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, Gentile nations, that they trample, they trample the holy city for 42 months, three and a half years, half of the tribulation period. Now, Newen, this is interesting. When I was studying this, one of my favorite commentaries is William Newell's commentary, as I've said in the past, on the book of Revelation. He wrote that commentary in 1935. And so one of the things he was discussing in his commentary was the prophetic reality that someday Israel was going to become a nation again. <laughs> so I was, I was reading that, wow, what did, when did he write this? I went back to the copyright, it's 1935, I think 13 years before Israel did become a nation again in um, 1948. So his commentary was interesting because he was talking about the prophecy of Israel regrouping in Israel as a nation again. Thirteen years later, it actually happened, as we know historically, to the current Israel that we have today. Thus, having a temple, which we'll see in a moment, the temple here, having a temple in Israel isn't that far-fetched. It's coming. We have missionaries, best Dr. Lewis knows them well, I know them well, um, ben and Ramona and Pastor Goworthy knows them well. Um, Simon, you know them well. Um, we, they've been in Jerusalem for many, many years, 20 plus years now. And the stories they, they we support them through IAGM. And the stories they talk about the rebuilding of the temple and some of the things being discussed within the back hallways, if I could use that term of Jerusalem, is pretty stark and pretty exciting when you hear about it. So the temple... Looking into this again, this is the future, has been constructed. The temple's back in Jerusalem for the Jews to worship. It was obviously a central point of focus for the Antichrist. We know in Daniel, prophetically, Daniel 9.27, and then again in chapter 13, this was the focal point of the Antichrist, was the temple. He wanted to set up his reign in Jerusalem in the Jewish temple. We know that. Now this will be, again... There will likely be a resumption of the sacrificial system, um, likely. I do not know that. It's hard to see that in today's climate with people protecting animals and such to actually have, start having animal blood sacrifices again in an active temple in Jerusalem. Seems like that might be a little far-fetched. But the best we can tell by reading this, this is exactly what's happening again. We're not saying that we understand everything happening here. I'm just giving you a narrative of what's being taught. And, and, and um, because some of this, we're just going to have to wait and find out. Now, this maybe, and I say that in parentheses, represents the last three and a half years of the tribulation period as the Gentiles trampling in the holy, holy city sort of points to the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. So that seems to be when these events are taking place. But again, that's a big maybe. We're not sure about that. Verse 3. And I will grant authority 
to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out of their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Then they, they, they have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth of every kind of plague as often as they desire. So these two guys are God's witnesses, and um, they're sent by God during this time in Jerusalem. Now you imagine, we understand the news coverage we have today. There is nothing happening on the globe that we're not aware of, is there? There's something going on in Ukraine, we have, video, we have cameras there. We something goes on anywhere on the four corners of the earth, we have cameras there. It's called CNN, Fox News, the media, they're everywhere. So rest assured, in the future, whenever this is, the whole world will be watching this event, not just Jerusalem. The whole world will be watching this event. Now, watch the discussion of who these guys are. And we're going to give, I'm going to give you an educated guess tonight, but it's just that an educated guess. It won't rock anyone's world because this is what most educated guests come up with. But I'll give you who we think they are, and you can add your own spin to this if you'd like. Please do. Some who allegorize this passage like to say these two witnesses represent simply the law and the prophets, or the law and the gospel, the two big dispensations, the gospel of law, the, the dispensation of law, and the dispensation of grace. They represent those two things. Some say they represent the Old Testament and the New Testament, both these two prophets. Others believe it's just a picture of the church, the church bearing witness to the Antichrist in the tribulation period. That'd be you and I, representatives of the church. Those are all, I would say, minority views. I'd say the majority views are there one of three people one most agree on is Elijah. Elijah is one of the two witnesses. That's what most, and the other would be the first one I would say is Enoch. Why do we say Enoch? Genesis 5, 24. He was, and then he was no more. He was taken into heaven, never experienced death. Elijah was taken in a whirlwind, never experienced death. So here they are back for planet earth for round two. And, and they go, and they go, and they're facing off the Antichrist. Um, so Enoch and Elijah were very good um, guesses, I, I guess. Or the next would say, um, I would say would be in the most prevalent idea is Elijah and Moses. Um, who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration? Elijah and Moses. So they've done this act before. <laughs> they've been down here before. Elijah and Moses. Elijah was the greatest prophet. Moses was the supreme lawgiver. And their acts seemed to fit each other's ministry. Moses acts, um, he, and, and, and what Elijah did on earth, they sent plagues on earth. Moses sent plagues to Egypt. There are plagues that these guys sent. Elijah calls fire down from heaven. They call fire down from heaven. So it seems to look as though that these, they both sort of do the same ministries they had on earth, same acts they had on earth during the great um, tribulation period. Malachi 4, verse 5, said this, Behold, I will send you Elijah. This is pointing to this time in history, we believe. Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, the second coming. So he tells us he's going to send us Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day that the, of, the, of the Lord comes, believing that's the second coming of Christ. That prophecy seems to definitely fit that Elijah's one of the two witnesses. Judges 1 verse 9, when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So, why was his body so important? Moses' body. We know Moses died. We know that. But there was a dispute in the heavenly realm about his body. It doesn't really tell us in Jude 1.9 why that was the case. But we know there was something uniquely special about Moses' body that was probably in light of Revelation chapter 11 and light of the Mount of Transfiguration could have been saved for such a day 
as this. So that's why I think most believe that these two prophets um, from God are Elijah and Moses. We could get there. We could be, when that day comes, they could be anybody. They could be Rush Limbaugh and, um, and um, who, God knows who else. Um, who, I'm trying, Ted Turner, that'd be an odd one. But they, anyway, so we could be, it could be anyone. So we don't know who they're going to be, but I think that's a good educated guess is those two guys. Now, Revelation 11, verse 7. And verse 7, yes, yeah, right. And when they had finished their testimony, the beast, the Antichrist, that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Now, first of all, let's stop there. And, and um, to, to have a dead body lying in the street of Jerusalem or any Jewish city is an abomination. Um, most of the, the Middle Eastern, especially the Jews, they will bury their dead the same day they die. There is no three days, four days, a week later. If they die on a Tuesday, they're buried on Tuesday. If they die on a Thursday, they're buried on Thursday. They do not wait. They do not bomb. It's part of their tradition, part of their custom. So, so to have three dead, dead bodies were unclean to the Jew. You, you are aware of that. And so to have three bodies lying in the streets, for uh, two bodies for three days, would be an abomination to the Jewish, to the Jewish race. And again, remember, CNN has the cameras rolling. Fox News has the cameras rolling. NBC, they're all there. The whole world is watching um, this event. For three and a half days, some of the people and the tribes and the languages and the nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in the tomb. And those who dwell on earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on them that saw them. Imagine that. Imagine watching the TV that night, late at night. Mom! You know, I mean, that, 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 that'd probably send a few cheers down your spine. You're watching, there they are, those dead corpses, when they get rid of them, wait, wait, one's breathing. One's getting up. He's walking around. Oh, I didn't think I'd be watching this tonight. That's something. And so anyway, and, and, so, and then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up, into a they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to God in heaven. Now, this is one of the few times in Revelation, as we've seen consistently through the book, in Revelation 11, verse 13, when cataclysmic things took place and they actually worshiped God and then get more stout-hearted and more bitter. It's an interesting response here. Again, the whole world was watching this event and the drama of these men, the drama of their death, the drama of them coming back to life and their ascension um, back to heaven. Now, going on, I'll just move on to verse 14 here. The second woe is past. The third woe is soon to come. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. Remember we talked about this in verse, I think, chapter 8, I think. The seventh trumpet. And there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. <clears throat> Once again, understand this chapter is not chronological. This is now looking forward again. Um, and this is probably points to the millennial kingdom that's going to follow um, the great tribulation period in, in the battle of Armageddon. This um, verse 15 is likely a fulfillment of Psalm 2.2. 2. You can write that down. It's actually Psalm 2 is prophetic, and this runs parallel with the second Psalm. We'll see a little bit more as we plunder through the rest of the verses here. And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and they worship them, God. Remember the 24 elders, that's the church. That's you and I. We're part of that crowd. This is the seventh time they've appeared thus far in the book of Revelation, these 24 elders. So that's you and I, the church of Jesus Christ, as we believe, 
um, um, who are sitting on thrones before God, we fall on our face and we worship him. <clears throat> Keep your, your eye on that word worship. Again, it keeps showing up, doesn't it? Since the first chapter of Revelation, and here we are in chapter 11, through every phase, every battle, everything that we see that goes on, there's still something that keeps happening over and over and over again. Jesus keeps getting worshipped. He's the focus of the worship of the four beasts. He's the focus of the worship of the dead from the tribulation of Revelation chapter 6. He's the focus of the worship of the 24 elders. And all the crowd that makes up heaven's population are always on the brink of and in the midst of celebrated, repetitive, spontaneous worship. And saying, we give thanks to the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Now they're pointing at his reign on earth. They give thanks because this is a fulfillment of Psalm 2.9, the reign of the Messiah on the earth. They get, so they're thanking you for that. The two words for power is interesting. In verse 17, there's two different words, dynamite and I forget the other one. But one speaks about absolute sovereignty over the entire universe. And the other, the authority to carry out any objective he may have. So God has absolute sovereign authority, and he also has the power to carry out any objective that he may have on the planet Earth. And as, again, we're worshiping him, so he's coming into the place where the end of the world as we know it is about to happen. He's setting, setting up his kingdom to reign in Jerusalem, fulfilling the covenant with David, to, to, to reign in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. Again, looking forward, we're going to have a whole other chapter on the millennial reign in about four weeks. But um, for now, this is, he's looking forward to that, to that moment. Verse 18, the nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, of those who fear your name, both great, small, and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Tough verse <clears throat> to understand somewhat into and to really interpret the word rage and wrath are a Greek play on words and in a sense it's a comparison of a man's powerless wrath compared to God's wrath which is all power this again this fulfills Revel I'm sorry Psalm 2 4 saw so 2 5 2 7 I think and then 2 4 it also fulfills Revelation 6 16 and 17 again this chapter is pretty chopped up it jumps all around the book of Revelation that's why it's so hard to follow. And this apparently is the second coming bringing an end to the great final battle of Armageddon, which again we'll see later on in the book. Now, this is where it gets this verse gets a little confusing. It talks about the judgment of the saints of these rewarding your servants. What is this judgment? And I'm I'm going to tell you here tonight, I'm not sure I know. It's my understanding and I could be wrong in this. I've been wrong once, I think, 22 years ago. <laughs> and actually, been a lot more since that. Um, um, that. That the judgment of believers, the Bema seat judgment of Jesus, comes at some point after the rapture, during the tribulation period. Um, we, I'm believing at the beginning of the tribulation period, while we're in heaven and the earth is raging below, that's when we stand before God as his church, born again, saved, and we receive our rewards as the church of Jesus Christ. That the Bema seat of Christ was a, a, a judgment that was um, exclusively for the church age, the church of, of, of me and you. That would be me and you. And this judgment, again, you'll find disagreement, great dis disagreement on this. This judgment is for the Old Testament saints that have um, hung in there, that were faithful. The judgment of those who were... Um, martyred during the tribulation period. This is a different judgment. Our judgment happens at the beginning of the tribulation period. Their judgment happens at the end of the tribulation period. Can I prove that? Absolutely not. And um, you'll find that there are varying disagreeings, dis disagreements on that. However, that's my best understanding of how to read the chronological time of this judgment into this, this timeline. Um, or this could be the same thing. This could be the same judgment. This could be the great BMC judgment. I don't think it is, 
But there are some that do, and they're smarter men than me. Verse 19, and God's, the, then God's temple in heaven was open. I love this. And the Ark of the Covenant, we finally found it. There it is. And the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and earthquake, and heavy hail. <clears throat> See, I believe that the temple talked about in verse 1 was an earthly temple. That was a temple built by the people on planet Earth and set up in Jerusalem. This temple in verse 19, 19 verses later, is the heavenly temple, a type of the heavenly temple, which we believe has always been there. You can read Hebrews 8, 5, and Hebrews 9, 22, really all of Hebrews 9. It gives you a picture of the heavenly temple, and the real Ark of the Covenant is there. Um, again, the Ark was given to the Old Testament dispensation. My Ark is in me. The presence of God lives in me. I am the Ark of the Covenant in this age. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6.20. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in me through his Holy Spirit. But back in before, before Christ died on the cross, before Pentecost, the Ark of the Covenant was, you know, in the Jewish faith, was above the mercy seat. Exodus Psalm 25, 22. He communed with God from above the mercy seat. So this, I believe, is a picture of the, the Jewish ark, in a sense, in heaven. Now, the Jewish ark disappeared. We know that. Harrison Ford's still looking for it. And um, some feel that it's buried someplace in Jerusalem still. Some think it's in Ethiopia still. And depending on what, what documentary you want to listen to. I talked to a tour guide in Israel when I went, and he was pretty convinced it was somewhere underneath the Temple Mount, many stories down in some secret room that no one's ever going to find unless they level the entire Temple Mount and dig 40 feet down. They'll never find it. He's convinced it's there. Some think that the Ark was supernaturally and mystically translated into heaven and that this is the very Ark of the Covenant that the Jews made. I think they're all right. I, I don't really know. All I know is this is the Ark of the Covenant. This is God's temple. And if you, again, would read Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 9 and some of Hebrews 10, you'll see that it lays out um, pretty, pretty easy. What I, want to, what I want to bring here, then I'm going to get into a little thing about worship. It's my belief, again, not held by all, that when Jesus died on the cross, he took his own blood, and when he ascended, he ascended with his own blood and placed his blood on this mercy seat in this temple for the once and for all, Hebrews 10, 10, 10, 14, for the once and all, for all sacrifice. We don't know that for sure, but again, reading Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, a little bit of 8, you'll find that it sort of alludes to that. That for all eternity, when we look into this temple, and that's our eternal abode, we'll be able to look at this mercy seat and see the blood of the true lamb on there. And you know what it's going to cause us to do? Worship. worship. It's just going to cause us to worship. That's going to be the greatest thing, I think, about heaven. It's just going to simply be worship. It's throughout the book of Revelations, it's front and center. And I believe, my friends, this question of worship is um, significant. What is worship? don't have much longer. You have 14 minutes, but I'd like to spend just maybe 11 of them on this subject, 11.2 of them on this subject. What, what is worship? First of all, when we have a worship service, we don't, it's not the music, that's the praise part of the worship service. When we fellowship around food, that's worship. When I give a cup of cold water in, in Jesus' name, that is worship. When I give of my financial resources with my tithes and offerings, that's, that's worship. When I take my notebooks out and I focus on the Word of God and I listen to what the Word of God is speaking to me on any given night, that is worship. When I get up early or go to bed late and I have my Bible open on my table, that is worship. Worship is everything and anything we do because of our love and heart and passion for Jesus. It's really simple. This is a worship service, but I think many of us, and I hope all of us, are worshipers all day long. 
oh, we worship in the morning, we worship in the noon, and we worship at night. We worship in our hearts. We worship with our voices. We worship with our, with our, our deeds and our acts and the things that we reflect that we live lives full of worship. Four questions that helps us bring, bring a barometer for where our hearts are at, or I should say the level of worship I may have in my life. Number one, what will be the center? What will be the center of my life? What's my starting point? What's my launching pad? Is it business, success, fame, good looks, being patted on the back, affirmation, security? What is the launching pad? What makes me tick? What am I all about? What is it that I seek? Psalm, David in Psalm 57 verses, so I get the right Psalm here. I left my Bible here. I borrowed this one. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I believe fixed is the word in the other translation. Awake my soul. Awake harp and lair. I, I will awaken in dawn. And the word, the word heart fixed here is a word that has a connotation of being in a place. The Hebrew word is kun. Um, K-U-W-N, and it has a, a connotation. You go into a door, and you shut the door behind you, and you lock it. It, 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 it eliminates your place of retreat. In other words, I'm going through the door. I'm not keeping the door open because I've gone through this door, and I'm, and I'm done. I've closed the door in the, that part of my life. I've now entered into a new place in my life. So he says, my heart is fixed on you, God. Whatever it was I'm leaving behind, I'm, I'm leaving that behind, and now you are the absolute focus of my heart. You are the focus of my life. That's what the word fixed there means. So it means, is, is Jesus the center of my worship? Does my life revolve around him, or does he revolve around me? In other words, is he the center, and everything in my life works out from him, or is he part, am I the center, and he's just part of the orbiting mass of my life going around me where I pick and choose him where I think I need to or want to? But when he's the center, it changes everything. He can't be, we cannot be objects of worship. He cannot be an object of worship unless he's the center. And that's something, my friends, we're going to talk about this Sunday morning. That's something only the Spirit of God can really show us about ourselves. Second question, what will the character of my life be? What will be the character of my life? The first was a, was a question of, of, um, set, of motivation and centering my life, but this is a question of discipleship. Now, when I talk about discipleship, I don't talk about um, doing stuff. That's not discipleship. Pharisees did stuff. They weren't disciples. Discipleship doesn't mean that I get really busy and do a bunch of stuff for my church, even though that could be part of discipleship. And if you want to try out and find, see if that works for you, I'm all, I'm all for that. <laughs> Just kidding you. But um, discipleship, when you look at the word disciple, it's an old word, man, thanos, an old student word. And it means student, but it's not just somebody who learns information. Disciple is somebody who reflects the spirit of the teacher. That's important. So it's not just me being able to recite scripture, not being able to have a scripture for every detail and category of my life, even though that's a very good thing to have. But it's me not just telling you about the love of God, but being the love of God. It's me just not telling you about God's peace, it's, it's having his peace. It's not giving you the doctrine of missions, but it's being a missionary, however I manifest for my life. See, it goes way beyond what we know, and it's who we become. We take our character, my friends, to eternity. That follows us, not our careers. Our character follows us. God is more interested in who we are, way more than ever, more interested in what we do. Third question, what will be the contribution of my life be? This is a question of service and fellowship in the body of Christ. What will the center of my life be? What will the character of my life be? Well, what will the contribution of my life be? What do I want to leave the kingdom of God? 
when my days on earth are over? What do I want to leave behind when I'm no longer alive on planet earth? Whatever that means. And again, that could be mean teaching the children and kids connection, which we can't put enough value on that. We really can't. That may be being coming and taking down a tree when we needed a tree taken down that was threatening the power supply. That may mean making a phone call and cleaning the, the pews because I had the machine to do it and the body of Christ needed me to do it. That may mean going to the nursing home and picking somebody up and bringing them to church or just visiting them and sitting with them. It doesn't have to come in the four walls of a church. It can be in your job the person in your job where you just love them and you lay down your life for them and you become Christ to them, that's your contribution. You may not be able to volunteer any time in any local church, but you can love the people around you and be a witness to those that you work with so they know and they see and they know that Jesus Christ is part of your life. What will the contribution of my life be? Lastly, what is the communication? <clears throat> of my life. <clears throat> and this is a question of mission, mission to the world. Christians sometimes place more life, more value on people's lives than the people. <laughs> Say that again, that's a good thing. We place more value sometimes on people's lives than the people do. One of the things that turned the world upside down in the early centuries of the Christian faith was how the Christian church rallied together and they fed the poor. They took care of, of babies that were left to die. They pulled elderly people off the streets and brought them to their homes. The first hospitals were Christians. The first nursing homes were Christians. The first educational systems were Christian. Christians started it because we had a communication to the world. And our communication is we value you, human life. We value you. You mean something to God. You mean so much to God that he sent his son to die on a cross for you. That's how much you mean to God. And if you mean that much to God, you mean that much to me. And anything I do for you is nothing compared to what Christ has done for you. That's the communication of my life. You're more important than I am. <laughs> my life will lay down this life for you. I know God, I want you to know him. I've been blessed by him, I want you to be blessed by him. That's my communication of my life. My friend, those are four questions. I hope you wrote them down. Think about them. Reflect on them, chew on them, pray over them. Ask the Spirit of God to teach you things about them, about yourself. Because they will give you and define for you your life of worship. I don't worship like I want to. I don't. I want to. I have a high goal. I find that myself I can get sidetracked real easy. I can get distracted real easy. I can follow flash bulbs and rabbit trails way too easy. And then a day or two passes before I realize I'm chasing that darn rabbit again. <laughs> And um, none of us have it perfect, but boy, it's a prayer of my heart. If I get to heaven and the only thing Jesus can say about me is, you know, Tim Kelly, he made enough bad decisions to bankrupt Austria. <laughs> he messed up here, he messed up here, he messed up here, but he, he, um, he worshipped me. He worshipped me in his relationships. He worshipped me in his marriage. He worshipped me as a dad. He worshipped me with his money. He worshipped me with his study life. He worshipped me in his quiet life. He, he worshipped me. His whole life was one of worship. And, and not a lot of people knew him, or barely any maybe, but he was a worshipper. I believe it's the worshippers that will get the recognition that we find for all eternity in heaven. Jesus, thank you for these words, and thank you for the precious people here. And Bless these words to our hearts. Make them real to us. Speak to us through your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.